We're going to read both Luke 9.23 and Philippians 3.10. Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And Paul in Philippians says, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power, <clears throat> excuse me, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. God bless the reading of his word. And Pastor Caitlin, if you would come forward. Thank you, Pastor Dave. It's good to be with you. It's good to see all of your smiling faces this morning in the midst of some hail and rain and snow. We never really know what's coming up. Um, but I'm glad to be able to open the Word of God with you. You may wonder why I'm sitting and using a stool, and that is just my spiritual practice right now of remembering to relax into Jesus. And uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Henry Nouwen, but he tells this story once where he was working with a community of developmentally disabled adults called L'Arche. And um, he was asked to speak on leadership. And he said, you know, I was reminded that leadership is done in community and it's a road of downward mobility. And so he said, I thought when I went and speak, I'd bring one of the individuals who I'm walking with in this community with me. His name was Bill. And so Bill and him fly to D.C. and they're sharing about leadership in the 21st century of following Jesus. And, and they get done and Bill gets up and says a few words. Um, Bill, with his, uh, with his challenges, still just had so much to offer. And so when they get down from that stage, Bill looks at Henry and he says, Henry, we did it together. <clears throat> And uh, just a sweet moment of remembering that whenever we come together, we're, we're really listening to the Lord. We're listening to the Holy Spirit, who's our teacher. And so that's what I've said to God this morning. God, if we're doing this together, then I'm here with you, and I want to be here. So will you join me as we pray? Thank you, Lord, for the privilege of joining together and coming before you. Thank you for your love which draws us and for the power of your Holy Spirit who transforms us and for the death of Jesus on the cross and his resurrection that makes it possible to enter into life with you. God, we love you and we want to hear from you. God, would your spirit speak to our hearts? Touch us and change us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as we've been walking through a season um, in the church, we have been looking at the sacraments, and we've also been walking through a season in, in the church at large called Lent. It's a season of intentional preparation for the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And... When I think about Lent, um, one of the things that I'm mindful of is that uh, there is a time when Christians all around the world gather together and say, hey, we are going to get ready for remembering what Christ has done on the cross. But not only remembering, that really the heart of the gospel is one of participation in the cross of Jesus Christ and what he's done. Now, if you look up Lent, you'll read something like this, that it's understood to be the 40 days before Easter, not counting the Sundays, an imitation of Jesus Christ fasting in the wilderness before he begins his public ministry. Now, historians generally agree that the 40-day period emerged following the Council of Nicaea in 325, so this goes back a long time. Earliest observances have particularly focused on the practice of fasting. Records suggest that the fast applied at first mainly to new converts as a period of repentance and reflection before baptism at Easter. In any case, it became a general church-wide practice. So Lent has been around for a long time, and it's been a season of self-denial, a season of fasting, in preparation for Good Friday and Easter. 
And now my goal isn't this morning to convince you to practice Lent or to recognize it as a season in the church calendar, although in more recent years in my own journey, I've grown to just deeply appreciate the practices of the church, which ground us in the history and tradition of how God has moved and give us rich and deep language that connects us with believers around the world. Whether you embrace this season of self-denial or not by giving up something, my heart this morning is that we would look together and encourage us to prepare for the cross of Christ, to prepare to take steps towards self-denial. As Pastor Dave read in Luke 9.23, Jesus says, whoever would follow me, they must deny themselves, they must take up their cross daily, and they must follow that we would learn how to live out that self-denial and dependence on the Father that Jesus calls us to. When we think about Jesus' death and resurrection, I think most of us are excited about participating in the resurrection. Who doesn't want to have new life and new hope and life everlasting with Jesus? But that first part, participating in his death, is way less comfortable. As I shared, I've been thinking about his words if anyone wants to come after me, they must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow. And realizing that that requires tremendous sacrifice. Recognizing that I am not a free man or a free woman, like I want to believe that there's a call in my life, that there's a mark on my life, and that mark is the cross of Jesus Christ. As we read earlier as well, the Apostle Paul puts it this way in the book of Philippians 3, verses 7 through 11. Whatever was gained to me, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. Whatever, anything that was gained, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things as loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rubbish or garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes by faith and is through Jesus Christ. And then these words, in a beautiful way, will haunt you if you don't know Jesus. Paul says, I want to know Christ. I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, the koinonia of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow to attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul is saying, I want to participate in the sufferings of Christ. I want to be so joined to the union, union of Christ. He's getting at one of the often misunderstood parts of being a follower of Jesus, and that is that the life of Jesus is one of participation, where we are called to take up our cross daily and follow him. It's not a bystander life, and many of us know that part. But the life of discipleship is one marked by the cross of downward mobility, where Paul says, I'm being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. That it's a life of obedience, and it's a life that marches us towards the cross because of the resurrection. Because Christ overcame death and resurrection, now I get to follow him as a woman who loves Jesus in the journey of death into new life. Now let me be clear. The Bible is clear in 1 Peter 3.18 that Christ suffered for sins once and for all, the righteous for the unrighteous to bring us to God. He was put to death in the body but made alive in the spirit. So you may be saying, hey, what does the cross have to do with me? There was one atonement, Jesus paid it all, it's once and for all, and now you're asking me to take up my cross and follow him? Yep, because that's what Jesus does. Now, there's a, there's, and I'll explain this in a, in a few minutes, um, there is one Savior of the world, and it's Jesus Christ. Nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. And a disciple is somebody who follows Jesus in his teachings and in the lifestyle. And there are things that, God calls us to do as a response 
to belonging to him. Romans 10, 9 puts it this way. If you confess with your mouth, right, if you declare, if you are in full agreement that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that Christ raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So here I've, I've emphasized that, bolded that word Lord, curious, right? So if I am saying with my mouth and with my whole being that Jesus is Lord, the word Lord here has to do with absolute ownership rights. If I am declaring that Jesus, you have absolute rights over my life, that's going to necessitate some following. It's not just a head thing. It's a life thing, right? There's going to thing, be things that I have to do with my life, my mind, and my body to follow Jesus. Many times we close up our Bibles and say, I believe and I receive, and then we go on living. Declaring necessi necessitates that we follow Jesus with all of our lives. Following him is at the heart of discipleship. When he called disciples to himself, he didn't start out with all his doctrinal beliefs. He says, hey, I see you fishing. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The call of discipleship was a call of following, and then it was a following towards the cross. Again, Jesus' words in Luke 9, 23. I've kind of spelled them out this way on the slide. If anyone would come after me, and this is kind of how it goes in the Greek, let them deny themselves, let them take up their cross, and let them follow. If we are going to follow after Jesus, there are things that we must do. Matthew 10, 20, 38 puts it even more sternly. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Oof. Sobering, right? Sobering. Should be. I love that Jesus puts it in there. Whoever does not take, let, their, let us take up our cross every day and follow me. You think that Lent is long in 40 days? Try a life surrendered to Jesus and every day taking up your cross and following him. Cross-bearing was a powerful image. Scarlett Darrow Bach says it this way, rejection stood at the center of that image, as well as accountability to the state. The cross-bearer had committed a severe crime and needed elimination. Criminals, they bore their own crosses as they journeyed to their death. Thus, for a Christian to bear a cross is to be prepared to face rejection and death even as one remains accountable to God for the path one walks. It means that one had to die to the world, separated from its values and its lifestyles, as we see in Galatians 6, 14. There are so many pulls on our time and our energy. There are so many detours along the way getting caught in the land of pleasure, self-servingness, independence, getting caught in pathways of pain. Not all pain will lead to transformation. It will lead to bitterness if it's not given into the hands of Jesus. So then how do we live a life of, of self-emptying, a life of self-denial? How are we so united with him that we remain in step or abide with him, as John says over and over in his gospel, and then in 1 John as well, in this journey where he says it costs us everything? Oswald Chambers reminded me, many of us go through his utmost, my utmost for his highest, and he was talking about this, this call of Jesus. And he said, look, Jesus is asking you when you take up your cross to be a living sacrifice. He's not asking you to be a dead sacrifice, which was a good reminder for me. Because sometimes I'm like, Jesus, I'm ready. I'm ready. And I, I may not be, but I think of the most extreme ways that I could serve Jesus. Our cross might look different. 
might look different. The journey that God has for me as it does for my sweet husband, Terry, as it does for Katerina. But the call is the same, to deny myself, to take up my cross and follow him. So how do we do this in practice? There's two things I want to look at around this today. The first is purpose. When you know your why, it changes everything. And the second is practice, looking at some of the practices of Jesus that help us along the way. Some of you may be familiar with Christian comedian Michael Jr. And if you aren't, I encourage you to look him up and maybe uh, get a few laughs along the way as he shares. <clears throat> he has a great skit on the importance of knowing your why. I'll share with you, uh, I won't share with you the clip this morning, but I'll share with you what one author said about it. He says, comedian Michael Jr. describes the power of knowing your why. In it, he shows an audience a clip from a different event in which a gentleman, a music teacher with a great voice, begins to sing a deep baritone song, refrain of amazing grace. And it's beautiful, and he sings amazing grace just as you and I would sing it here. <clears throat> but after praising his performance, the comedian asks the teacher to do it again. But this time, he paints a scenario of true appreciation, such as his family member just, be, just getting released from prison, and then him singing Amazing Grace. Not surprisingly, the second performance far outshines the first, because he knew his why, right? The words were more animated and the tone was deeper and richer. I tried uh, imitating this and when I was practicing and Pastor Terry's like, Kate, I love your heart. Maybe uh, don't try singing this morning. So uh, I'll leave you to the comedy skit. But <clears throat> Michael says, when you know your why, then your what has more impact because you're working towards your purpose. <coughs> Jesus, back to discipleship. Philippians 2 says he emptied himself. He takes the form of a servant. And he comes, becomes obedient to death, even death on a cross. Why? Because he knows his why. Hebrews 12, 2, for the joy set before him. He endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the Father. He knew the joy of seating, being seated at the right hand of the Father. And I love how Philippians 2 says it, because he knows that every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and declare that Jesus is Lord. So the question isn't really this morning, am I going to bow my knee to Jesus? The question is, when will I? Because at the end of time, when we're all face to face with Jesus, we are all going to be bowing our knees to Jesus. It's just a matter of whether we're doing that in submission to him now and then spending eternity with him, or we're doing it later, separated from him but recognizing his glory. We endure because we know that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed. We understand that this time is short. In his book, Spirit of the Disciplines, Dallas Willard writes about how many people preach how difficult and costly discipleship is, kind of like I'm doing today, right? Take up your cross and follow him. He says, though, it, it must not be left to stand as the whole truth. We would do far better to lay a clear, consistent emphasis upon the cost of non-discipleship as well. As Soren Kierkegaard reminds us, it costs a man just as much or even more to go to hell than to come to heaven. He goes on and notes Proverbs 13, 15 that says, the way of the transgressor is hard. The way of the unfaithful leads to their destruction. This side of eternity is short. And by the grace of God, I want to run that race with perseverance, taking up my cross and following Jesus. So then how do I do that in everyday life when 
I'm running around being a mom. Katerina's tugging at my pant legs or spilling something or there's conversations with people. It's so easy to lose perspective and practice. I will say, uh, a, a side note here, that I was encouraged this past week specifically around parenting and discipleship. When my sweet friend Carrie, um, who leads worship here, shared with me a book about how parenting itself can be a journey, be the sweetest journey of almost monastic life where we follow after Jesus and learning to deny ourselves. And, and what she said was, St. Benedict has talked about when people decided that they were going to remove themselves from society and they were going to go be away to be with Jesus and pray, they had what was called a monastic bell. And that bell rang in the middle of whatever the monks were doing and you had to stop, not cross your T's or dot your I's, you had to go and run to the main space where all the monks were gathered, and it was a reminder that your time belonged to Jesus, no matter what you were doing. And so this author contends, isn't parenthood, when submitted to Jesus, a little bit like that? When Kat comes up and pulls on my pant leg and I'm in the middle of trying to prepare something, or when she screams, Mom, I need help right now. And it sounds like an emergency, but really one of her dolls needs to be dressed. <laughs> if it's submitted to Jesus, I can learn through the real life situations that God has put me in as a mom how to deny myself and follow Jesus. Really, the only way to learn how to follow Jesus is through practice, right? Through that regular practice of denying yourself and relying on the Holy Spirit to make you new. In Ezekiel 36, 26 to 27, we read the promise that has now been fulfilled. I will give you a new heart. I'll put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you to move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. I love that language because so often we get to the New Testament and we think, freedom! It's always freedom for. It's freedom from Slavery and the, and the sinful nature that we would be freed up to follow Jesus. That he would give us his heart. He would put his spirit in us that would allow us to follow and obey his decrees. So now we have the indwelling spirit when we've put our trust in Jesus. So following Jesus doesn't come from a place of law. It comes from a place of love. And a heart transformed by Jesus wants to follow Jesus. It wants to love its neighbor. It couldn't think of anyone else, as Oswald pointed this out once. And yet we struggle with the impacts of our old nature, and we have to train ourselves or habituate ourselves to denying ourselves and following Jesus. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in 1 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself Who's that on? Who's the train yourself part on? Us. Yes, it's on you to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise for the life, present life, and the life to come. Training, practice, learn dependency. Or he puts it this way in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 26. Do you not know that all the runners in the race run? And it's really fun this morning because we have two folks in our congregation who literally just came from a run. So there we go. Thank you, Jesus. This is a confirmation that this is where we were going this morning. Run, and you don't have to run, right? Uh, some of us, there was a season that, with immobility for me where I couldn't run. But this is a metaphor here. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the game goes into strict training. 
They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last. Therefore, I don't run like someone aimlessly. I don't fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Paul was so committed to running the race till the very end that his fear was that after he had preached, there would be nothing that would stop him from being faithful because he didn't want to be disqualified. God, have mercy. God, have mercy on me. <clears throat> if you look this passage up, what you'll find is that the Greeks hosted great athletic festivals of the Olympic and Isthmian Games. The latter were held at Corinth and were very familiar to the recipients of Paul's letter. Contestants in the game participated, get this, 10 months of mandatory training. If they failed to complete this training, they were barred from the competition. The major attraction at the games was the lengthy race, and that was the illustration Paul used to depict the Christian life. Paul contended that his actions had not been those of an aimless competitor, but were comparable to those who had an athlete, who had been an athlete and had the goal of winning. Paul had disciplined himself, curtailed his own rights for exercising his freedom, all for the sake of the gospel. Spiritual training, spiritual disciplines, and by that I mean practices that Jesus did like fasting or prayer or silence and solitude, where he got away, where Jesus, fully God and fully man, practiced regular dependency on his father on the road to the cross. Now, when I say spiritual disciplines or spiritual practices, there are some of you here who are probably going to have a visceral reaction of, oh, great, there's more that I need to do. But the heart here is not shame-based at all. Simply an invitation from Jesus. I would contend that when the spiritual practices word brings up something in you that maybe there's some woundedness that God wants to heal or some misunderstanding. Because as I already mentioned, life with, great, with Jesus is one that we're saved by grace. We're freed up for service to him. We read this in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's not from yourselves. Not by works so no one can boast. We're like, great, clear. He goes on, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus. What? To do? What are we to do? Good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So there's things that we are to do, that works flow from and in response to a heart that is transformed by grace. What Paul is referring here. What Paul is referring to here, I think there's a slide on this, Judy, is meritorious works. That our works do not give us merit to be made right with God, but rather they flow from or are a response to a life transformed by the grace of God. Does that make sense? Yeah, are you guys with me? Okay. They flow from and are a response to a life of grace. A person, a man or woman who is following Jesus, we will have to learn how to yield ourselves to the Lord and depend on him. And it will involve training and it will involve practice. So one scholar says, a baseball player who expects to excel in the game without adequate exercise of his body is no more ridiculous than a Christian who hopes to be able to act in the manner of Christ when put to the test without the appropriate exercise and godly training. No one ever says, if you want to be a great athlete, 
or vault 18 feet, run the mile under four minutes. Or if you want to be a great music musician, play the Beethoven Violin Concerto. Instead, we advise the young artist or athlete to enter a kind of overall life, one involving deep associations with qualified people, as well as a rigorously scheduled time, diet, and activity for the mind and body. I saw this with training with the CLIMB team uh, got the privilege of being part of a program years ago at Seattle's Union Gospel Mission called Climbing Out of Homelessness. And there were several of us who trained alongside men and women coming out of recovery and addiction to climb Mount Rainier. And so it involved several months of training of carrying heavy backpacks on our, our back. And Rachel was a part of this that same year. That's actually how we became friends. Thank you, Jesus. Um, and we would go on hikes throughout Puget Sound to really, and the hikes would get progressively harder to go get ready. The qualifying hike was a hike to Mount Hood. And right before that, I had injured my tibia, which, uh, as we've prayed for Jean here, my heart goes out to her because that's what happened to her. And, and so I was like, no, I'm still going to do this. This is really important to me. <clears throat> so I, I made it only to about 10,000 feet of Mount Hood, and, and I stopped there. But I'll tell you what, I got a lot further in training than had I if I had just said, hey, I'm going to join the team trying to climb Mount Hood this morning. Because it had involved months and months of training and exercise and community. Community, I think that part is so important. And walking with others. I got close to the top and I literally almost had a panic attack on Mount Hood. And some brothers and sisters walked me down. That's why God puts us in community. I mean, there's so many reasons, right? It's not singularly focused. But if you are wanting to practice following Jesus and you're serious about following him, you better get yourself around some other people who love Jesus and are running the race too. And stay with them, not just on Sundays. Philippians 2, 12 to 13 we read this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Paul writing to the church in Philippi, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. I love this because there's that interplay. Well, whose job is it? God's? Mine. Yes? Yes, you respond and I get to respond in grace to the prompting of the Holy Spirit to fulfill the things that God has already prepared for us. Some of you may wake up in the morning and feel really discouraged, like you don't have purpose. Maybe you're in a season of transition it's like, am I useful? My body's breaking down. My mind is bothering me. I just want to encourage you this morning with these words. God created you in advance to follow after him, and he has specific things for you to do. There is never a moment and I need to remind myself of this sometimes because I've had my own journey with anxiety and depression. There's never a moment where there's no purpose. There's never a moment. But sometimes you can't see that, so you're going to need to be in community for other people to grab your arm when you're having a panic attack at 10,000 feet on Mount Hood. Say, oh, I got you. I'm with you. And you've got to do what folks like Virginia and Patty and Janine and Marilyn did yesterday, where they made themselves vulnerable in community. And they let others in to their story, that the grace of God might be seen in their lives. And so that other woman could come up to them after and say, man, Virginia, I'm dealing with that too. 
would you pray for me? Would you walk with me? There are no shortcuts to sanctification. There are no shortcuts as we train our minds and bodies to follow Jesus. Psychiatrist M. Scott Peck in The Road Less Traveled puts it this way, There are many people I know who possess a vision of evolution yet seem to lack the will for it. They believe and want to believe that it's possible to skip over the discipline to find an easy shortcut to sainthood. Often they attempt to attain it by simply imitating the superficial the superficialities of the saints, like retiring to the desert, like I talked about before, or taking up carpentry. Jesus was a carpenter, so if I work with my hands, I'm clearly going to become like Jesus. Some even believe that by such imitation, they have really become saints and prophets and are unable to acknowledge that they are still children and face the painful fact that they must start at the beginning and go through the middle. There are no shortcuts to sanctification with Jesus. Daily taking up our cross involves practices along the way that allow us to learn how to endure when life gets hard. What we do with our minds and bodies in everyday life is to be offered up to God as a sacrifice. I love how Paul puts it in Romans 6, 13 through 14. He says, look, you used to yield the members, your members, like literally the parts of your physical body, of yourselves, in bondage to impurity and to lawlessness. So now yield the parts of your body in bondage to righteousness unto sanctification. Set yourselves apart to serve Jesus. <clears throat> One of the things that was really fun over the spring was uh, working through 1 John with a number of you here. And one of the things that comes up in the letter of 1 John is this, what's called this um, pre-Gnostic or this belief that had circulated at the time that the body was bad, that everything material was bad, and the only thing wa that was good was the spiritual. And so there was kind of a disdain for the physical body, and how could it be used in the process of redemption? And then Christ comes in the incarnation and says, there is something good and beautiful about flesh, right? Redeemed can be offered up to God. And so there was something that early Christians had to learn. And then Paul goes and says in Romans 12 too, I urge you in view of God's mercy to what? Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, that this is your spiritual act of worship. That our bodies are to be submitted to Jesus and actually helpful in the transformation process. Some of you here may have experienced tremendous trauma in your body in such a way that acknowledging that God wants to work through your body feels really unsafe. And so it's common in the midst of trauma when you've lost agency over yourself for parts of you to shut down so that you never have to feel again what you felt. And some of this happens involuntarily, just as God's wired our body with our limbic system, fight, flight, or freeze, he's wired us so that there are certain parts of our brain that literally shut off, like our thinking capacity, so that when we go through trauma, we know how to survive. <clears throat> my encouragement and my prayer this morning is if that's you and your body has felt like an unsafe place to be human, to offer up to Jesus, to let him meet you there, to let him minister to you, to seek somebody after who loves Jesus to pray with you. I spent enough time working with men or 
mostly with working with women coming out of homelessness and addiction and recovery to know that a lot of us carry a lot of wounds. And they're not just in our minds. There's a famous book out there called The Body Keeps the Score. And I think it's important that if we're going to live offering, if I'm going to offer all of me to Jesus, that I want him to heal all of me. And I want him to touch those places. Marilyn spoke about this yesterday, about how God, as he's provided for her, that he's a safe God. Some of you haven't known physical safety for a long time in certain parts of your body. And I just encourage you this morning to let God minister to you there because he wants to use all of you in that submission to him. Paul learned to discipline his mind and body into submission to his father. Jesus did too. Jesus, fully God, fully man. Right? Pastor Terry and I were talking about this, and he's like, he had to learn dependency before he started his ministry. It's like, yeah, absolutely, because he's sinless, right? But even at the age of 12, he's in the temple. He's learning the scriptures. He's seeking after God. And then before he starts his public ministry and the spirit descends on him like a dove, and the voice says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Then what does the spirit do? Sends him off. Where? To the wilderness. Fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. That's actually where the practice of Lent comes from. Satan, because he's hungry, and we read in Matthew that in Matthew's account, Jesus is hungry, which makes sense. All of us would be after 40 days and 40 nights. Cam comes to him. Satan thinks, hey, this is an opportune time to test the Savior. And I love how this is so patterned of how God works, right? Every time that Satan thinks, man, I've got you. I got him in the grave. I got him hungry. God says, you ain't seen nothing yet, right? There is more to this story because I am the God of resurrection and new life. And those who trust in me and submit themselves to me, is my power that will work through them. And so what Satan thinks is an opportune time to test him. Jesus has learned to depend on the Father in a very deep way through 40 days of ultimate dependency. And when the test comes, he's ready to endure. He had practiced 40 days and 40 nights to depend on the Father. And so no matter what Satan came and threw at him, power, privilege, food, be gone in the name of Jesus. The spiritual disciplines help create lifestyles of dependency, which is at the heart of Jesus' ministry. Jesus says in John 5, 19, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees the Father doing. Because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. You mean I, I, I have to follow? That's the heart? That's the heart of discipleship? Yeah. That's the heart, and that's what God has been walking me through. So I like to plan and schedule things out, and there's a role, and the Lord can work through that process. And I'm learning just by the grace of God through practice, through practice, through failing, through practice, where I sense the gentle nudge of the Holy Spirit are you going to obey me here? It's small. Many of us, I think, have an overinflated view of ourselves where we think that when we meet the moment of crisis, we'll be able to just endure and respond like Jesus did. But our call isn't just to do what Jesus did in action. It's to take his yoke upon, him, upon us, to learn from him, to have his character and his heart, that be ours, so that the actions then flow from a heart and a life that looks like Jesus's. 
it's probably going to involve, involve failing, right? I was telling Katerina, failure. She's like, I met last night. She was having a meltdown because she got a new shirt and she spilled something on it right away, which all of us do. It's such a common human thing. She's like, I messed this up. This is my new shirt, mom. It's like, Katerina, failure is the first attempt in learning. You're going to fail all the time. It's OK. You've got to learn from this. This will dry. We'll clean it and move forward. Some of us get so stuck in the moment of failure that Jesus calls us forward and we're still stuck in the past. He's like, are you going to walk forward with me into the future that I have for you and with you? God knows, I'm going to wrap up here, how easy it is for you and I to be conformed to the pattern of this world. The way we're transformed is by daily renewing our hearts and minds and posturing ourselves at the feet of the cross, right? That's why we kneel. If we can't kneel physically, God knows that's totally fine. But that's why we take and posture ourselves in a position of humility before God. Sometimes we have to Remind ourselves, not just in our mind, but what I do with the rest of my body is yielded to Jesus and in submission to him. That journey of practice. That's why schools do emergency drills. Because they are trying to teach us to habituate through practice of what to do in case of an emergency. Apart from the grace of God, you and I will do whatever we have practiced doing most. And if the Son of Man, if Jesus, the Son of Man and the Son of God, understood that it was important that as he was going to live a life of dependency with the Father, that he would regularly pull away in silence and solitude, that fasting would be a part of it, that he would be communing with God in prayer, so much so that in the garden he says, if it's possible, Take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. That posture of total surrender. Then why would we think it wasn't important for us? Why would we think that in that moment we'll just do, do the right thing? I want to close with this part. <clears throat> I have a slide of a coffee cup that Judy will put up. Thank you. And for those of us who love the Pacific Northwest, coffee is a regular part of our mornings. Maybe yours in the afternoon, but I can't do coffee past like 10 a.m. Um, or I will be up all night. <clears throat> yeah, Sophia and I were having that conversation this morning because she has, she has a really good coffee from uh, Dutch Brothers. I was like, oh man, one of their coffees will keep me up. Anyways. Shortly after Terry and I got married, we're brewing our coffee, right? And I say, hey, are you going to have some coffee this morning? No. Why not? You have it every morning. Well, I regularly try to practice giving up caffeine because I don't want to be mastered by anything else. I was like, wow, good for you. Glad God hasn't asked me to do that. <laughs> It stood with me. We've been married almost six years now, and I, other than days of fasting, I don't give up coffee. But it was that reminder for me, whether it's something big or something small, I only want to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. I don't want to be dependent on anything. And I want to learn how to practice intentionally denying myself in big ways or small, that they would be submitted to Jesus. So what is Jesus inviting you to do today? I believe he's inviting all of us to come to him and to find life that's truly life. Or as Mark says in Mark 8, 34 through 35, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for my sake will save it. Lord, we want to follow you. 
We need your help. Teach us, Holy Spirit, and give us the courage to practice. Thank you for the community to practice with. And thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that is never something we do alone. In Jesus' name, amen.